Good afternoon, everyone. Rudy Page back here again. Great to see you all. And we're on the Regco Reggae Global and Culture, one of our what we call the Creative Economy forums, where we look at the sharing and the, the pooling of knowledge and the sharing of revenues, the ideas and the cultural aspects to the reggae industry. And I'm so pleased today, our theme for this dialogue is reggae mental health and spiritual well-being. So we have my resident colleague, Brailsford Dawkins, and a much better new colleague, Dawn Carr. <laughs> Just add that bit. Great to see you both. Thanks for inviting us, really, really glad to be here. <laughs> Great. So um, important and serious <clears throat> subject, reggae, mental health and spiritual well-being. And the theme today is why should the devil have all the good music? Explain, Beresford Dawkins. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, Rudy. And I'm really glad to be here. Um, I think... <clears throat> It starts quite simply, really. I think growing up in church, um, as, as many of us was, um, reggae music in particular was seen as the devil's music. Um, and once you decided to become a Christian or live in a Christian home, um, our parents and our communities um, would, would not want you to associate with kind of music whatever that kind of music was like i said because they saw it as the devil's music and it was something that once you became a christian um you left that world behind which included perhaps um smoking drugs alcohol loose women and reggae music was included in that group um so that's why um i wanted to sort of broach the whole conversation from that point of view and um and what I began to realize certainly as a, as a young Christian man growing up in the church as I did from the age of 12, um, you know, leaving that music behind be became a bit of a challenge be for me because I was forced to listen to Jim Reeves and Elvis Presley and <laughs> country music, which I really couldn't connect with in the way that um, certainly my parents and, and that ch whole church community wanted me to. Um, so I, I sort of started to, on the down low, if you like, listen to, to reggae music. And, and that's where I began to realise that actually um, reggae music is, is, is a rich um, and serious art form. Um, and it really started to educate me about who I was and where I came from, um, being British born with um, Jamaican parents, there was a clear education element to the music. So I was listening to people like Big Youth, of course, Bob Marley um, from, from Jamaica. Um, but then, so the British element, um, growing up through um, two, two riots, one in 81 and, and one in 85, I began to listen to people like, um, um, Steel Pulse, which was um, the equivalent, really, to, mm -hmm. to Bob Marley in terms of their popular popularity across Europe and, and across the globe. And, and they were sort of hitting me with some excellent melodies, beautiful melodies, but they were also challenging me about some of the terrible things that were happening in the world. Mm, powerful like social messages as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like health inequalities, race, um, the issues around, you know, the black disease um, and, and, you know, people like the Ku Klux Klan. So there was this album called mm -hmm. Hansworth and Revolution, right. which yeah. I was really into, which looked at some of the, the social, um, economic and political issues that, you know, really was hitting me as I was growing up as a youth. So that was some of the challenges that I had. And, mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, I found reggae music to be really that you know it talked about spiritual love um, it gave me an understanding about you know that human love between male and female and ultimately how important it was to to love god you know 
and or as the Rastas would call it in the seventies, Ja Rastafari. You know, it was that yeah. kind of yeah, um, that power and so, that real meaning of what it meant internally and yeah. spiritually. That that was That's an right. integral and, and part and then of where the mental health and spiritual well-being aspect came in to being important, but not yet recognized, particularly by the generation before us, our parents' generation. And uh, That's right, because, you know, our, our, our parents were, were just working hard, really, to, to sustain the home. They, they weren't really that observant, I don't believe, of, of the politics and, and the world order. But some of these things were impacting us in our school, in our education and just in in the streets so you know you know we we started to look at some of those issues as we were growing up so yeah the whole criminal justice and it certainly in this instance the whole mental health um, became a real issue for for us growing up stop and search was at the heart of some of the things that we were experiencing in the community representation and disproportionality in both prisons and also um, mental health care, which is the area which I, I now work. So if, if you think, as you mentioned that then, and we could spend some time around the living, the lived environment of our generation, and it's important for people to understand that what we're talking about, those really at this point, you know, um, would have been growing up 60s, 70s, 80s, getting into manhood in the 80s, so to speak, and womanhood as well, because we're talking about the, the, the children of the Windrush generation. And, and, uh, and then when you link that across to mental health and the spiritual well-being and what was happening even at that time as it related to mental health, and yeah. then the, the treatment within that living, lived environment, and we, and we know that to get the best outcomes for people is to be in an environment of love, compassion, and to be treated with humanity. And so some of these yeah. things were difficult for our parents to understand that that's what their children actually needed because those environments growing up in school out on the street were not anywhere near anything related to compassion. And to, so some, some of our generation, of course, they uh, succumb to many of the difficulties, hence why the mental health system with the kind of numbers of our generation, which of course yeah, sure. has impacted and, the community. And, and I think, let's be clear, I think in the homes, um, certainly in my home in, in the 60s, um, I grew up in a loving and a very caring environment. Um, but it was what was happening once I stepped out the front door. Um, and like you say, when I started to go to school, <clears throat> excuse me and also later then going into to college um, and, and studying further and then going into the workplace um, and that's where some of the challenges became and you referenced there the 1948 Windrush which, which is really important um, because um, I remember Theresa May um, our previous prime minister was was talking about citizenship and the fact that we you know she blatantly said that she didn't if you didn't have you any citizenship or certainly if you didn't have your papers papers there was no belonging to england and that really concerned me as a young man who was growing up in england uh, born and bred here this is my home my family's here extended family third and fourth generation are here and i really was sort of choked by that literally and i was i was emotionally moved by that comment and and then when you marry that up with some of the issues around inequalities within our prisons and also within um, uh, mental health care i began to see a, a clearer picture of what it meant to belong and and the links to jamaica and the music which we're obviously going to explore a little bit more but the links to um, you know, I, I work within a mental health institution mm -hmm. where, you know, at least, well, between um, um, 19, uh, sorry, um, 20, 2014 and 2016, we had some 30,000 people refer to themselves as 
um, black and ethnic minority. And here's the, the difficult challenge for me, um, linked to the sense of belonging. Some um, near just under 10,000 of that 30,000 were from African Caribbean descent. And, and the geographical to, area? Yeah, the geographical area was over um, 1.2 million catchments area with some 60,000 patients across across the uh, broad. Birmingham, um, Birmingham, for those who Bir are not in the UK. That's right. So this is Birmingham specific. Um, we serve a 1.2 million catchments area with 60,000 patients we look after. So between 2014 and 2016, 30,000 of those patients described themselves as black and ethnic minority. And when I looked into those figures even more closely, which is really important to that we look at data, mm -hmm. just under 9,000 of those were from Jamaica, specifically African Caribbean descent, and that included mixed race. And, 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 and a significant proportion of those were in um, 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 secure and complex care. And the age range, and what was the age range? And the age range for, the, for those individuals was from 18 up to um, 60, but there was a, a specific mm. age of 18 to 35, African Caribbean mm. male. So, so that's actually third generation. So they're the children of the children of the Windrush generation. Absolutely. Because that's, um, that's our generation's children, actually. That's right. Mine and your children's generation. So we, and, that we know. Yeah. yeah so to, to be clear, to, that has to be a concern. If you're working in the mental health sector or the criminal justice sector, that has to be a concern to, to us. And that sense of belonging and, and, and broken spirituality has to be look, looked at. And, and I think this discussion around reggae, mental health and spiritual well-being really helps us to, to start to have mm. those discussions about how important um, the music is um, in terms of how we um, use music to tell the stories um, of, of, um, of um, belonging and spirituality. And of course, to support recovery. Yeah, I mean, I think recovery um, in terms of mental health, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex situation, um, but certainly 80% of people who experience mental health, they recover. Um, but I think we have to be a lot more radical in terms of our approaches, um, in terms of support and recovery. And again, we can't keep commissioning the same old services because there's clearly something wrong. This is a historic problem about overrepresentation and disproportionality. Mm. So therefore, that tells me that we have to do something very radical, something very different. And I think there is a clear opportunity for us to be working Mm. Um, certainly the UK, Birmingham specific needs to think about working with Jamaica to look at how we break down some of these issues of mm. belonging in particular. So, so, so Dawn, it'd be interesting to get your perspectives on what we've just discussed. Yeah, over. it's an interesting discussion and thanks for that Beresford. Um, I think you've opened up you know, the, the, the path for, for what I was going to talk about. And I'm going to come from a very kind of technical aspect and talk about just music in, in general and how music can be used as a clinical intervention um, as well as spiritual as well. And um, I've been working on a project at the moment where we're looking at uh, the resilience of the black community, in particular, the, you know, what are those um, factors that uh, contribute to our resilience? And, uh, you know, the, the, I'm talking about the black community in its whole entirety, not just the African Caribbean, but the African, they could be American black, you know, anybody who's, you know, from the black diaspora. And it doesn't matter who you talk to from that diaspora. There are some, you know, key uh, cross-cutting things in terms of resilience, and music is one of them. Now, I'm going to just kind of define what music therapy is from a technical aspect. So music therapy has been um, here in the UK as a recognised uh, psychological clinical in intervention since about 2011. Um, so it's used within the NHS, it's used within services, and it's, it's recognised as a way of supporting people who have psychological 
cognitive, physical or communicative um, and social needs. So this could be somebody um, who has, is a, a child with autism, uh, right through to somebody you know who's got um, uh, uh, cognitive requirements due to you know acquired brain injury, dementia, um, and, you know, anything like that, and you know it's used within the uh, NHS mm -hmm. as a clinical uh, um, intervention. Um, however, I'm saying since 2011, we know within the Black community that music has always been an integral part of our well-being. This goes back centuries. So, you know, they may have like, you know, discovered this in 2011, but it's always been part of our, you know, our um, psyche, our spiritual um, health and well-being. And, you know, just, just part of our social uh, way of interacting with each other. Now, going back to what Beresford was saying about, you know, having, you know, not respecting certain aspects of music and the benefits of, of certain music. Um, I'm going to talk about dementia support in particular. So, so for, if, if anybody knows when you've got dementia, uh, you may have a very short term um, memory uh, where you can't remember what happens like today, but you might have a, a very good long term recollection recollection or you know be able to reminisce about things that happened you know back in the day when you were younger or maybe you know just settling here in the in you know in the UK mm -hmm. and it's very very important that we recognize this um, especially within dementia but it, it goes across mental health and all of our well-being is that everybody's spiritual journey is different some may be you know um, you know on a spiritual journey right through from birth to, to now. Some may have joined that spiritual journey at a different time. Now, if somebody was listening to reggae music or exposed to reggae music as part of their upbringing, and this is, this is what spurs their emotions, it, spur, it spurs their, you know, their, their, their spiritual intellect and everything, um, then th when they <laughs> recollect on those feelings, those emotions that make them feel well, you know, feel well and, 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 and able, um, it may not be um, secular music that they're listening to right now. It may be um, the old time music that's part of their upbringing, part of their um, their journey to where they are now, or you know, or, or part of special memories like the day they got married, or the day their daughter was born, or or something like that. So it's very important that you you, you recognise um, how that fits into the jigsaw, jigsaw in terms of uh, you know person's well-being and 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 um and you know, and obviously honor that as part of the process also as, 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 as the other thing i want to say is that music that jamaican music that reggae music whatever it is it doesn't have to be from from jamaica um it, it also encompasses your um your spiritual heritage so it's the, the, the politics, the culture of that era, um, the, you know, what was going on socially in that era, era your, your neighbourhood, your environment, all those things that nurtured you to the person that you are today. Mm. So it's important to recognise that as part of the therapy. Yeah, and that's real, real good point. So, Bersford, where I'd like to take us along those lines next then. Yeah. We're speaking generationally, and that we're talking about belonging and feeling excluded. As we said, that generation that you indicated, most of those were born here. Yeah. Of whose parents were born here and their grandparents may be in the Caribbean, but there's still this issue relating to belonging. And then you link that with a term that you use, spiritually broken. But in this country, we have had at least two generations of institution builders, whether community centers, churches, and what have you, and other kind of, let's talk entertainment industry. So a lot of resources, skill, entrepreneurship, effort has gone into improving life. So it, from a collective responsibility then, it, it seems, and you touched on commissioning, that we should, by now, our generation should be either reorientating our, ourselves in this, what we call the COVID post-pandemic era, to actually respond to those 
needs, which are our needs, our, ourselves, because we can diagnose very clearly, we understand evidence, we can read data, we can interpret it, we can implement it, as Dawn said, really mm. indicated that we've understood what the solution is. So it's going to be one big mindset shift, of course, we've got the personal stories, but um, there's something about the spirit then in terms of being able to collaborate and put together that type of institution. And of course, this institution is only the sharing of resources. So, so yeah. it's, where do we step from here? Because it, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual aspect and spiritual leadership that will just enable people to understand that this is how we get out of this crisis. So it's leadership as well, you know. Yeah, I think I think you, you raised some really good points there, Rudy, and I, and I think we're going to need another program to really dissect, <laughs> to really dissect it. But I think this post-COVID um, pandemic has really, for me, um, caused for much reflection Mm. on what is spirituality yes. and what it is our religious um, organizations and religious institution um, what kind of impact you know is is say the church in this case maybe the Pentecostal church mm. uh, or or just church period or mm. you know um, religion period what kind of impact are we having on some of the most vulnerable people in yeah. our in our community and, and and that's the reality of it i think we have just focused on corporate worship um and i think we have focused on um institutions and systemic um, challenges which is right and proper to do but i think certainly certainly for me and dawn in the areas that we work we're we're it's all about community and family, yeah. and family. and what we're learning um, during this pandemic, and everybody's you know really happy to go back to what it was. I think what we're finding in our circles, there are some, you know, we with all the grief and the loss that we have experienced, which is you know probably the worst thing to come out of this pandemic. Mm. But some of the good things that have come out, we're starting to refocus and look what it means to one belong. What is community? Yes. What it is, what is that village? You know, that, yeah. you know, you know, people's talking about it, it takes a child to raise a village. Well, what does that look like in 2021? And we're starting to reflect on that in a way that um, we probably wouldn't have done before the pandemic. So I really welcome that. Because again, if, if, we, if we're focusing on commissioning and delivering mm. services, um, we are the most researched community <laughs> that I know. You know, you cannot research us anymore. Yeah. You know, over the, over the COVID period, people have been reading more, people have gone out and bought books, which have been sitting on those shelves getting dusty. Yeah. Once you get into some of that, and then you link that to spirituality in terms yeah. of, you know, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, then clearly some of the responses that we need to, to, to design, to use the term, to co-deliver, to, um, um, to um, facilitate through the whole of our communities. And that's right across the board. As Dawn said, it, it's not specific to one community. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something that's coming out of the black experience that should be around leadership. Because I think actually, if we get it right for some of the most vulnerable people in our society, for me, it means that we get it right for everyone. For, for, for everyone, absolutely. Everyone. And, it's, and, and that's the leadership argument that we need exactly. to bring to this table. Yeah. In, because I think that's what's emerging out of this situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a lot of things that we can focus on. And um, COVID has really put you know, the microscope and the magnifying glass on all the issues that we've just raised. But there's a leadership emerging here as well. That, and, and, that's, and that's what's beautiful about this experience. Um, um, I'm thinking, as you say that, the, the, the theology around this and being yeah. able to translate that learning and to unlearn maybe aspects of it for, for this time. I mean, 
what are you, what are your thoughts on that because the, yeah. the the spiritual leadership has been a challenge because if you take the african caribbean population group particularly yeah. we were one of the the slowest groups to respond to mutual aid we we're now one of the slowest groups to respond to the vaccine we're, we're not clear in our minds that whether if we don't take it or well, what does it mean if we do take it where what you know what information where are we getting our sources of information do we trust our own people so so what is the spiritual impact and mental health impact <laughs> over the coming oh, year or two yeah now and again i think i think that's just such a <laughs> such an interesting uh, comment but the, the theology as i see Mm. And this is my view. Don't might have a different, but I don't think it'd be that different from mine. To be yeah. fair. I think my the theology behind this whole and you mentioned the vaccine to take the vaccine or not to take take the vaccine. Mm. That is the question. But my my theology is, is is we have to understand where we see God in the world. How do how do how does Rudy Page? How does Dawn? How does Barrister Dawkins see God in the world? And once we begin to understand how we see God, we will then begin to understand right. how we see humans and humanity, which, which is a thing called anthropology. It's how we see humans. And once we start to understand how we see humans, then we'll know how to respond. That's the sociology. That's how we see society. And once we understand what who God is in the space, how we see humans, and then how we see sociology, then so, so, we'll know how mm. to respond in terms of, mm. so if you think of some of the things myself and Dawn are doing on the ground, mm. we're not talking about strat strat strategic, we're not talking about implementation, which is your thing, mm. we're talking about what does that actually look like on the ground? How mm. do we respond to those vulnerable people that we're, we've just described? Um, you know, absolutely. Bob Marley, yeah, so Bob good. Marley says it this way, you know, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Yes. Remember ourselves can free our minds. So he's going back to that mental health issue. Yeah. And, and, then, and then you, you yeah. marry that up with what the scripture says, Romans 12 and verse 2. Do not conform yourself any longer to the patterns of the world, but be renewed by the transformation and the renewing of your mind. Yes. And then to translate that now into treat, treating people with love, compassion, and humanity. Yeah in the absence of the leadership of our current institutional structures, what is the ordinary vulnerable person to do? I, I think, I think if, if love and compassion, we all have it. Mm -hmm. And again, the pandemic, I mean, I've seen some random acts of kindness from people who would not call themselves religious and certainly not Christian. So there's something in our human nature that says actually, exactly. you know, we know what is the difference between right and wrong. We know how to care for people with love and compassion. Um, I would say the, in the corporate world, those are the touchy-feely things that we don't really want to reference. We don't like talking about love and care and compassion yeah. within our, our fancy um, Prince 2 project plans. <laughs> <laughs> people you just, you humans. Don't wanna, yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't want to you don't want to include humans in that but yeah. that's the point mm -hmm. and i think we're starting to see a shift a resetting where we're actually talking about care compassion what is it what is it to be human mm -hmm. uh, and i think those are the things yeah. that really get me excited and passionate about and, and as you say that just before let dawn come back in is that again the strength of relationships, mutual relationships, expectations, professional codes, you know, values. Yeah. You morals. Know, morals. Yeah. yeah. Those those kind of words we just yeah. don't normally like to use. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but they're, they're the words for now and going forward. If we're going to influence mm -hmm. actions, mindset shift, because that's what we're now talking about. We're talking about being in, in an era where there's a mindset shift required from where we are now. Dawn, Dawn, Dawn's got the solution. I, I only wish I did, but um, how, how can I top what yeah. Beres has said? I think yeah. he's, he's absolutely right. You know, we need to 
find the the God within and translate that God mm -hmm. in terms of humanity, love, values, all the things that you just said. So you took the words right out of my mouth. But where where we can add to that mm -hmm. is how we share share that learning. Share, yeah. And we touched on you know the leadership issues that we have at the moment. And, you know, and can I say it that, you know, our spiritual leaders, some of our spiritual leaders do work in silos. So I think it's really important that, you know, we, we have a, a shared vision, a shared message, a shared approach and share that across, you know, all communities, whether they're of faith or not. It show that love, show that compassion, show that humanity, lead the way as, as an example of good practice. Mm -hmm. And through sharing alone, you know, that is a, the first step, you know, into healing, you know, the community. Community is the biggest word here. So, you know, we, we have to find a way of, of how we're going to come together, share that learning. We, we're, we're all going through a shared experience. And I know I keep on saying the word shared here, but it is really, really it's, important. It's a, it's a powerful term. And the way you set it there is quite important from an implementation perspective because what you're saying there as well there's the level of collective responsibility is in is in there and uh, being capable of collaborating within ourselves in our own interests yes and as Boris had previously outlined is that being prepared to help others and not expect anything else in return because this era that we're in now it yes it's about others as well as ourselves because the threat that we're in is one to, to, to all of us and our only way through that is that collective shared uh, approach because we need the knowledge and skills and experience and ideas from from everybody exactly and i think the the interesting thing about this pandemic is as i said it's a shared experience we're all going through the same pain mm -hmm. the same social isolation and loss, and loss. Yeah. <laughs> the same loss the same grieving yeah. everybody's experiencing no matter what background you're from yeah, exactly. how poor you are you know what your you know your social status is yeah. everybody's going through the same experience so this is a perfect opportunity to share the love share them share the knowledge reach out with our hands and and, and create a new approach to spirituality, a new approach to supporting the community, because everybody's got that shared understanding. When we when we all are asked over all of this, and we go back to our previous lives or our new normal lives, and, you know, then the, there won't be any ears to listen. People will be just carrying on with what they need to do. But this is the perfect opportunity to have conversations and and just to to go out there and implement whatever whatever the you know it, it is that we're going to implement once we, we figure it all out you're so right and Beres, we're back to you your favorite word resilience tell us about that because that's where we need to get to that's that to me is a rallying flag if <laughs> you know we, we we need a flag to rally around I think, was it um, Steel Palms? Rally Around the Flag. It's one of their songs, I'm sure. Rally Around Something. I can't say I recognize that one. Yeah. Um, but, but certainly, <clears throat> I think alongside resilience, I think, it, I think we, we, as a community, we're, we're naturally resilient. Mm -hmm. I think, but we never ever spend the time to think about what that is. So if I was to say to you, really, you know, what what is resilience? What, and then you 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 just say to me, oh, I don't know. I, um, I just I just crack on, and that's yeah. the point. And but we're back to that on? clarity and definition. Absolutely, we must start to name. You know, it's it's not good enough just to say I'm resilient, and I, and I just I just get on with it. So when the boss says to me, Dawkins, go and do this again, I, and I just look at him and I just crack on and I deliver again, I perform again. It's time we start to think about what that actually means, you know, um, and, and, and that's the point. So I think we are a, a resilient community. I don't think that is necessarily the issue apart from naming what is resilience. I think it's more about galvanizing, 
to be honest. It's yeah, about honest. how we come together in in a certain way, in a radical way. Because like I said, we understand what the issues are. And furthermore, we know what the solutions are. And right. there's some real innov innovative stuff out there. So some real creativity out there. Yeah, so you, we're, we're now, when you're in these sort of crisis, you, you normally use as the first word, rethinking. Rethinking. Yeah, and, Whatever and it is, you put yeah, rethinking, and, if you can put rethinking and people can accept we're rethinking whatever it is and then you say to everybody all voices must be heard that's right and in that rethinking and reflection rest assured yes. people will come with solutions exactly that's what the resilience is it, exactly because as you, was you, stated, you have the ability it's been done to before back. yeah you've, you've had you have the ability to bounce back yeah but it's been done before generations before us in worse socio-economic positions than we could even imagine. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. So it's been done before, wasn't it? That's right. And then, and then here, here we are, we're talking about the links between Britain and Jamaica and the music. Yeah. Therein lies. The solution the, is in there, isn't it? The solution <laughs> is in there. You know what I mean? Let's, you know, and, and between the three of us, I'm pretty sure we could knock out a program almost immediately. Exactly. It tells us, you know, exchange programs would happen. Um, the music goes without saying. And then the whole mental health and well-being yeah. and the whole sense of belonging. Um, and we, again, and, and if I'm we... I'm sure Dawn wants to jump in on that one. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Go on, Dawn. <laughs> No, I mean, I think, you know, you said it all, but, you know, I think that what's important is when we do start to unpick it, um, you know, especially that journey, let's just say that, 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 you know, that Jamaica, England, you know, journey in terms of music and music therapy and, and how we, we link it spiritually. It's, it's about what, once we have that conversation with, with, you know, with God and, you know, and ourselves, it's about having an honest conversation being honest about what does resilience um, really look like on that journey, on that path, mm -hmm. and 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 being able to get, for for the spiritual leaders to give people the space to be honest, the space to say, you know, this is what works for me. Right? Mm -hmm. What works for me might not be mm -hmm. are in scriptures. You know, there, there might be additional things outside of that which work for me, and the spiritual leaders. Have to embrace that and incorporate that in the pathway of support you know as we move forward um to ignore all, all of that is going to be at the detriment of the community yeah and as you say pathway of support if you think of the normal way we would deliver learning and facilitate learning in the community you know it's about awareness it's about understanding and then you know what the call to action is so that pathway of information, advice, guidance, and support then is essential that you, you've been listening to some of those personal stories that say that this, this worked best for me before, or if I was given the opportunity to do this, I, I would feel better. Because at the end of the day, this is always about how we feel. So, you know, when you're looking into these things, you, you normally say, what action needs to be taken to improve your feeling of well-being? So it's you as an individual, and, and, how do you and, feel about the situation? Yeah, and myself and Dawn are involved, and, and yourself would be as well, you know, in what we call an appreciative inquiry. Exactly. Which is where we're looking at the whole um, idea without being judgmental about it, mm -hmm. but then being able to just have that understanding and the listening is the key thing here because yeah. once you ask people about resilience in an appreciative way it suggests that actually you're going to have some kind of empathy and some mm -hmm. kind of appreciation and you care you care and about their and journey actually and care their story. About what they've got to say to you. <laughs> so when they've finished speaking yeah. you're at this you have this balance mm -hmm. and you're in the space and you understand actually there's a meeting of minds and this is what we're going to do to respond to the situation and therein lies that radical change and support with care and love and compassion that actually gives you 
the, the end solution so that we can all coexist together in the same space. With equity, with equity, by the way, which is another program, I'm sure. Equity is really important. Yeah, I mean, just okay. that, that that opens up a whole new area. So Dawn, yeah. just the other thing in relation to what Brailsford said. So as you're aware, it's Jamaica's 60th anniversary next year. And we believe it will be, you know, the second largest, because obviously diamond, diamond celebrations is an important milestone. So our theme for it is homeward bound. Okay. Homeward bound, right. And of course, that, that's got lots of many layers of thought. What do we mean by homeward bound? And of course, the exchange program is about belonging. And, we, and we touched on it because again, our generation, and I'm talking about Brailsford's age, not, not me and you's age, right? Our generation, we, we may have been born here in the UK and our children may have been born here, but the environment that they live in, and we, this gets back to the mental health and the, and the broken spirituality that Bresford mentioned, that you don't belong here. The wind, this, let's just say Windrush and leave it at that. And then you could follow your parents' roots and your grandparents back to Jamaica, to the Caribbean or to Africa. And that you will yeah. hope that you will be welcome there as well but it that journey may help you in your recovery going back to what you touched on there's many things about culture heritage that can support the recovery so that's behind that and of course in there you've got the rites of passage as well of course so that's why we feel this the idea of the exchange program is an integral part of re the recovery and growth as well and development so it's not all negative you know absolutely and you know one i'm really looking forward to celebrating jamaica's 60th next year and i think your theme homeward bound is is the most perfect theme and the reason why i say this is because i mean i deliver um black heritage walks so we do walks you know um around the city uh which kind of highlights you know the, the journey of the the black in particular the black caribbean community here you know in the uk and uh, i go into schools and i do heritage pro you know programs in schools and i am amazed how many young people are not aware of their own you know heritage background and you know it, I'm, I'm i say i'm amazed i'm dismayed actually mm, yeah um if you know there's a there's a, another spiritual phrase that's called sankofa where absolutely you, you have to look back in order to, in order to move forward, forward. Yeah. and so if if we have a, a, a generation of people and this is not just the ones in school we've got this middle layer of youth and even amongst our own age group yeah you know, um, people who are unaware of you know their background where they come from and how that you know um plays out in their own spiritual being mm -hmm. So they become lost people and you know they're, they're forever trying to find themselves so it's very very important um, that we do um engage in that way look back you know to homebound um, ha ha continue that dialogue with the elders uh, continue that learning and, and and learn not just from you know um i'm going to say the windrush part of our of our you know our yeah. hum humongous heritage yeah. you know, even further back than that yeah. Um, so I, I hope that you do take it that way when you, you know when you do it and you know and, and and find a way to you know for everybody to engage with that theme. Yeah, well, we're inviting you to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But seriously, the, the the thinking is important, and if it inspires people to just to think about what we're saying and they do their own thing, that's fine. That's why we 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 promote it as an open idea. It's for anyone to interpret the way they want want to so but you raise a good point about the homeward bound in terms of also looking back which is so again it's like history and heritage it moves forwards and backwards absolutely forward. so homeward bound is forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards yeah, yeah. thanks for that i'm 
we we will use that. <laughs> See, I'm useful. I told you I'd be useful. <laughs> you did. You did. You did indeed. Right. So, um, birds for dawn. We're coming to the end. So I'll just ask both of you just for a last word or two before we before we close this particular session. Um. Again, I think it's been a really great discussion. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you again for inviting us onto this. And um, I think it's really important for us to be radical in terms of the dialogue that we've just had. And it's clear that, you know, reggae, um, resilience and sort of our heritage. And, and again, the spiritual side, and, you know, we could talk about how reggae music is now giving God glory. <laughs> uh, yeah. in the way that we, we're you know we're thinking about it and, and and i think that's the point we're giving god the glory with reggae music i think there'd be some people who would just never put that sentence in you know those words reggae and giving god the glory in the same sentence and, and as a young man certainly i never thought i would do that because of you know the, the way i was being um fashioned to believe but i can actually say you know what there is some mileage and some heritage in reggae music and spirituality. Um, and again, the devil doesn't have to have all the good music. In fact, and, and that's how I'd, I'd want to finish it. But clearly the exchange programs and the over representations of um, young Jamaican men is a concern. And I think between us, we can certainly um, and that's the population of Jamaica and the population of England with all the research and all the data that we have. There's a clear link to what we should be doing. Um, and I'm certainly really up for, for engaging in, 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 a, in a new dialogue about how we support individuals in recovery around their mental health. Thank you. Go on. Again, I mean, I, I came here to celebrate uh, Reggae Month with you all and, and to, to celebrate and to, and to explore how reggae can be used in spirituality. And, um, you know, it's been a really interesting debate. I've really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, I just wanted to end this by saying, um, you know, I've, I've been all over the world and, you know, it's, it's really funny because, you know, uh, I've, I've, you know, people always say to me, you know, when I go uh, abroad, you know, where are you from? And I say, well, I'm from Jamaica, of course. Well, I'm a Jamaican background. I live in England, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a Jamaican background. Yeah. Um, and if people can't speak English, the first thing they say is, yeah. oh, Bob Marley. Bob Marley. You know, Bob Marley. <laughs> uh, so, um, <clears throat> so it just goes to show the power of reggae music across the universe, not just here in Birmingham with our community, you know, across the universe. And if... If that, if that one aspect, right, can have such an effect on everybody globally yeah. and universally, can you imagine how it would be if we could use it, use that as a weapon, a spiritual weapon, you know, to, to enhance people? So that's I just want to close it with that. Great. Yeah. Thank you both very much. And thank you all. This is Reggae Mental Health and Spiritual Wellbeing. And we shall see you again soon. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>